Hey, Google, what happened today in Black history? On February 2nd, 1960, four young freshmen from North Carolina A&T University, David Richmond, Franklin McCain, Azel A. Blair Jr., and Joseph McNeil, were joined by more than 20 other Black students to challenge racial segregation at store lunch counters in Greensboro, North Carolina. The sit-in movement started on February 1, 1960 and led to similar actions across the South. Today, on the campus of North Carolina A&T, a monument entitled February 1 stands in honor of the day the Greensboro Four dared to sit. Adapted from Black Heritage Day Four calendar by author, lecturer, and civil rights activist, Dr. Carl Mack. I just want to give you just a little bit more insight to that. What we have to remember is that what those four freshmen did at from North Carolina A&T was just the four of them started the movement on February 1st. I have them featured on February 2nd because on the 2nd, there were 20 other students that joined them. And this mm. city and movement, they said that they were not going to leave until the changes at Woolworth, and we're talking Woolworth department store that had the lunch counters. And even though they can go in there and shop, when they went to eat, they couldn't sit at the counter. So this movement went from February 1st, 1960, all the mm. way to July. 25th, 1960. And let me just take you through the timeline real quickly. Wow. So on the 2nd, about 20 students joined them. Now, on the 3rd of February, uh, I'm sorry, on the 5th of February, it was the 3rd or the 5th, there were like 1,400 students from North Carolina a t because pressure was being put on them. It was on the 5th. Pressure was being put on them to quit. And so 1,400 of their classmates uh, from North Carolina a t all went to the auditorium and they voted, no, we're going to keep this thing going. And, uh, I'm sorry, that was on the 6th of February. Mm. Um, and then news spread about what these brothers and what they were doing at North Carolina a t in Greensboro. It just spread across the South. So you had Winston-Salem, Raleigh, Charlotte, Richmond, Virginia, Lexington, Kentucky, and even in Jackson, Mississippi, where students from Tougaloo College joined in. And by May 16th, of that year, 1960, even Dwight Eisenhower stated that he was sympathetic to what these brothers and sisters were doing because mm. it was part of their constitutional right. So in one of those cities that it spread to was obviously Nashville. Now in Nashville, as a result of what these four brothers did, they started the Nashville uh, city and movement. They started the Nashville movement. Now at that, there was a brother by the name of uh, James Lawson Jr who was the mentor of that Nashville committee. Under him, you had people like Diane Nash, Marion Berry, John Lewis, mm. Um, mm. Okay. Uh, who, who, who learned under him. Now, the thing I want you to remember about Bevel is that now when you go to May 1963 in Birmingham, when that whole Birmingham march came, Bevel mm, was the one right. that advised Dr. King to use children to get involved in it. But now remember those names that I just told you, because then the SCLC wanted to capitalize on what these young folks were doing. So Martin Luther King sent an That's invitation. That's the Southern Christian Leadership Council. Southern Christian Leadership the Southern, Council. The Southern, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Southern Leadership Conference. They sent an invitation to these students from all across the country. And it was conducted by Ella Baker. So these students, based on what these uh, Greensboro Four did, they met at Shaw University. And they met at Shaw um, University. At that invitation, there was about anywhere between 125, you know, stats are kind of different, it was 125 to 200 students. And again, of those students, you had Diane Nash, you had John Lewis, Marion Barry, Julian Bond. All of these mm. brothers and sisters mm. were a part of that movement. And then what they did was that's where the wow. freedom rides and that's where SNCC came from. So SNCC came out of that movement that started at Shaw University. Um, mm. So in a, that's, in a sense, um, <clears throat> what these that's a lot that stemmed from that single flashpoint. Uh, from, Dr. From Mack, well, from that flashpoint, what I'm hearing you saying is from from that flashpoint, all of this trajectory, those names that you listed, I mean, it, it's amazing how those four guys, that that one incident sparked so much of what we know uh, about our history and the civil rights movement. Yeah. And, and again, those four brothers, David Richmond, Franklin McCain, Ezell Blair Jr. and Joseph McNeil, all freshmen. 
And just because they were fed up, they literally set black students across the country on fire. And when wow. they started in that movement, you had sisters from Bennett College. And the thing I want to tell you about Bennett College is that at Bennett College, there was a sister from my hometown from Jackson, Mississippi, named Willa Player. Now, mm -hmm. Willa Player became the first black woman to lead a four-year institution in this country. And so when the sisters from Bennett College wanted to be involved in the movement, as the president of the college, President Player said, look, you go in there and you do what you have to do. And if you get arrested, we'll bring your homework to you in jail. And when those students from Bennett College, those sisters got arrested, True to her word, she had the instructors to take their homework to them while they were in jail so that they can keep their academics going. So, again, what wow. those four brothers did, and that's why wow. if you go to the campus of North Carolina A&T now, they have a monument of those four brothers entitled February 1. But, again, from that movement, mm. that's, what, that's what lit the entire South on fire of getting these young brothers and sisters involved. And that led to the formation of SNCC. And from SNCC, you had the Freedom Rides. And from the Freedom Rides, yeah. trust me, there were brothers and sisters that just did phenomenal work. And again, with Bevels, just remember 1963, what ended the yeah. Montgomery bus, the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, not the bus boycott, but the Montgomery uh, situation was Bevel said to King, we should use children. So they used children as as young as third and fourth grade. Uh, and these children ended up getting arrested. But because these children, little bitty children got involved in this situation, that's what bought Birmingham. And, and you remember Birmingham because that's what Bull Connor said, yeah. the holes yeah. and the dogs on everybody. But it was James I Bevel, who was one of the students under Lawson, and learned about this nonviolent uh, means. That's what Bob Burton Technique, had. yeah. Let me, um, I think this is, a, a, I mentioned, we want to get to Ukraine, and, and Brother Marcus, good morning to you. You haven't had, a, I know we haven't heard from you yet, and I want to come to you, uh, but I actually want to dovetail this conversation with one of the stories that I uh, wanted to cover this morning, which is the 12 HBCUs. When you mentioned North Carolina A&T, I, I, the first thing I think of is it's an HBCU, obviously, uh, and 12 HBCUs that have now been hit with uh, bomb threats, one of which is Bethune-Cookman University. That's the university that I attended uh, for several years and marched in the marching band there. Um, it is, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can look at this, Brother Marcus, but you you have to, one, look at it through the lens of race because you just can't ignore the direct line, the racial component of targeting black colleges and universities, historically black colleges and universities, and two, a, a political extension of all this fear mongering around critical race theory. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100 percent. You know, I think um, even without you know, uh, the, the, the recent like culture war dust up of critical race theory, you know, so HBCUs are still going to be targeted. And I mean, there's some HBCUs that you have a majority white, you know, uh, uh student attendance, um, mm. you know, and there's something that I, I, I talked about this, uh, yesterday and, um, you know, I'd had to ask my audience to just say how many people even went to school that had a bomb threat. Mm -hmm. And now this is something that is very prevalent mm -hmm. in America. I've been attended two different schools that at a time had a bomb threat. Now, mm -hmm. did this coincide with yes, finals? Sir. Sometimes. Yeah. You know, did it yeah. not at all? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Is it scary both times? Absolutely. But the thing with, with this that, that we need to focus on is that HBCUs, that's not a regionally specific type of location for colleges. You know, they, they're, they, they're spread out uh, pretty much across the East. And when you've got multiple getting these bomb threats, there's really only one way to look at it. It's not this, that's right. you know, offhand, Hey, this is school in America where people get shot up and there's bomb threats all the time when it's targeting HBCUs like this, um, it, it, it 100% goes back to the, the racist narratives that this country has done very little to, to exercise. Mm, that's right. It's still here, Brother Mack, and it's it's deeply rooted. And, and I think about uh, those four brothers at the counter, they were fighting to be able to eat at Woolworths while they were able to shop and get clothes there. Um, it's recent enough that I, too, 
I've shopped at Woolworths, at least now. I mean, in my lifetime, I was able to shop there. But I bring that up because this history is not that long ago. Right. We're not yeah. talking about any, I think sometimes we see black and white photos and we think that it's such a long time ago. But Woolworths is some. There it is. Yeah. And, go ahead, and, go ahead, brother man. And, and again, Ben, you, you, you have to think about what these four brothers did. I mean, basically, because of what they did on February 1st, 1960. There were over 58 sit-in movements that took place in the South just because of what they did. And then, like I said, what 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 was birthed out of that? And everybody, no matter what college or university they were in, they were just excited that these four brothers had the courage. And then ultimately, all of the a A&T Aggies joined in with them. It, it, it was just an absolutely incredible situation. And Ben, I want to tell you that when it came to an end. So on July 25th, 1960, as a result of their movement, Woolworth lost about $200,000. And today, in 20, well, not today, but in 2020 terms, that would equate to about $1.7 million. And so because of the economic loss, the store manager there, a guy named Clarence Harris, decided, look, man, we got to bring this thing to an end. So he took four of his black employees, told them to get out of their uniforms, put on their regular dress clothes, and sit at the counter, and they served them. And that happened on July 25th, mm. 1960. Wow. That's what brought that, uh, brought wow. that to me. You know, and I'll say, uh, if I could add, like, Brother Back, appreciating that you bring, you like, assembled all this and and, and, and and get to bring this every day. Um, and I, I, I just can't help but think about how this is. there's a difference between organizing and, and mobilizing. I mean, Kwame Torre has a, has a great quote over that, and that's, that's a thing of where, if you're just trying to get something popular to attach to a hashtag, you know, it's only going to get so far. You'll just get something popular. But if you're trying to mobilize people into an effort, into a goal, and I'll even take it recently to the Howard students who yes. were mm. mobilizing to get better housing. Um, and so, you know, that's that that's really the ticket is not, you know, how do we how do we get people in action? Because that yes. that four four people uh, in one booth led to 58 across the nation. And, we gotta and, keep and brother Marcus, the thing that one of the unsung heroes that we just do not hear about in our history um, is brother Lawson. When you look at what James Lawson did at Fisk University, I mean, as, as part of that Nashville City movement, he was the he was literally the mentor, the architect behind these great names that you heard. Marion Barry, who went on to become mayor of D.C., John Lewis became a congressman, Diane Nash, who, yeah. who led, uh, was a founder of SNCC, led the Freedom Ride movements, and, and again, James Bevel. This man was literally training hundreds of, 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 of great black leaders. He, he was an absolutely phenomenal individual. <laughs>